Well, hey, everybody, Nate here. Our guest today is Kathy Hanoon. Kathy is president and co-founder of Dandelion Energy. They install retrofit geothermal energy systems in homes in the Northeast. This is a energy, clean energy technology that will heat and cool your house by harvesting, I'll say, the, the ambient ground temperatures under our feet. It almost sounds too good to be true. And Kathy's an excellent spokesperson, and she has really gotten involved in this industry. And you're going to learn a lot about it. There's HVAC work, there's plumbing, there's mining and well drilling kind of technologies happening. There's a lot going on with this, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. I certainly did. Without any further ado, Kathy Hanoon from Dandelion Energy. Thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your day. And I really have just like a massive list of question marks in my head all about geothermal. But why don't we start at the beginning? Because I was looking at your resume on uh, LinkedIn and it's pretty, you got quite a interesting resume, Stanford and working at Google to some extent or Google X. Can you kind of give us the background of your career and, and what led you to this moment right now, uh, schooling and career wise? Absolutely. And let me say, I never, when I started out, I never would have guessed that I would have a geothermal heating and cooling company, but, um, but I guess in retrospect, it does make sense. So in school, I studied civil engineering and ended up um, taking a job at Google that had nothing to do with civil engineering. I had studied civil engineering because I really wanted to have a career focused on how we use natural resources. And civil engineering, it's a lot about our infrastructure and how we build our infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure that we choose to build, it really dictates for many, many years how we use natural resources and which resources we use. But when I graduated, there it wasn't clear to me how to translate what I had studied into a, into a career. So anyway, Google hires a lot out of Stanford. So it was um, a job I took sort of with the hope of getting some work experience and figuring things out a little bit more. And I ended up experimenting with a lot of different types of roles at Google, but eventually I got a product manager position at Google X and X is Alphabet's moonshot factory. So um, the part of the company where they do, for example, the self-driving car, which is of course such a fun and amazing place to be, especially uh, relatively early in my career. And I ended up sort of getting this position where I got to search for new moonshots to do and hearkening back to sort of the interest that drove me to pursue civil engineering. I really wanted to find a moonshot in the climate space or in energy, just because what bigger problem is there to solve at this time, this moment in history. And it, it does seem to me like a problem that is especially, um, tractable perhaps to, with technology and science. It's like technology and science are good tools for going after how we use energy. And I explored so many different ideas in the space, but eventually geothermal heat pumps really surprisingly uh, stood out. And I think what stood out about them is they're an example of a technology or a product where the customer's incentives, so saving money, having a better product, are totally aligned with society's incentives to decrease carbon emissions and use energy in a more efficient way. And it's just like pretty unique to see how aligned they were. And then when I looked at what was holding geothermal heat pumps back, because they're such a niche technology, a lot of the things holding them back seemed like things that were tractable that we could probably fix. So Hmm. It's, it just seemed like such a huge opportunity. Um, and ultimately, that Google X project became a standalone company. So I co-founded that startup in 2017 outside of X hmm. and have grown it independently since then. 
Well, that's amazing. I, I got to think with an engineering background and with that mindset, thinking about climate and technology, it's it's a different way of thinking about it. You know, the way engineers think about all problems, like hey, this is the problem. What's the engineering solution, you know, to alleviate this problem most efficiently, let's say. Do you remember like the the moment or at least when geothermal really popped on your radar and how it popped on your radar and what that was like compared to, yeah, I don't know, I'm sure you've looked <laughs> at all of the clean energy uh, technologies and, and what was it like once you kind of really looked close at geothermal? Yeah, well, the moment it popped on my radar was when a software engineer, unrelated to X, but a software engineer at Google working out of the New York office emailed this giant listserv at Google, just any anyone working there who was interested in energy could sign up to be on this um, email list. So I was on it. Probably tens of thousands of us, I have no idea. But this um, software engineer just emailed everyone with this extremely long, detailed, passionate email all about why geothermal heat pumps were the number one thing that the U.S. could invest in to have the biggest impact in meeting our climate goals. So it was a very audacious claim. Um, wow. However, it was detailed enough and sort of supported enough and logical enough that it it really made me curious. Yeah, you're there's like, there's got to be a chink in the armor here. There's got to be yeah. some reason that it's not exactly. as simple as what this fellow is exactly. saying. That's exactly that's exactly my thinking. I was like, well, I've never heard of this. He's really making quite a strong case for it. What's the catch, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of my job at the time was to find the catch. So it was actually like very well aligned to what I was supposed to be using my time at work to do, which was mm. convenient. So um, I started by emailing him back and that led to a conversation. Then I did other research. Um, his name is Bob Wyman, by the way. He's still very active in promoting geothermal and very successful at it. But with most of these ideas that I had looked into at X, it's like the more you look into it, the more likely you are to find the catch. It starts to become clear why a given technology hasn't been done or is hard to do, right? Mm. But the weird and compelling thing about geothermal heat pumps is the deeper I dug, the more the more probable it seemed to me that there that that catch wasn't going to be there. It was like very unique in that way where it's like the more I learned, the more I felt like I understood why it was a niche technology, but it didn't have to be. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was the analysis we did that really drove that home for me is um, we did this analysis where we looked at how much people spend on heating their homes just across the country and across the world. It was a global analysis, but then we focused in on the United States and just the amount of money people spend heating their homes, even in just the Northeast is astronomical. And I think at that time, I lived in the Bay Area of California. It's very mild. It's like perfect weather. Mm -hmm. Even though I grew up in New Hampshire, I had kind of forgotten how um, how giant that expenditure is. And it's a necessity, right? Like everyone has to keep their home warm to live. So just seeing the enormity of those expenses and then combined with how many people are still using fuel oil to heat their homes and propane to heat their homes, these very expensive um, kind of necessary evil type of heating fuels mm -hmm. that no one likes using, it made it clear that there was a lot of room from the customer's perspective to bring a better product to market. And then in parallel, we looked at what price point we thought was realistic for being able to bring geo to market, at least at first, you know, as we work our way down the cost curve. And we found that we we really felt, yeah, we can do this. We can we can bring geothermal to market packaged in a way that's easy for customers at a price point that actually saves people money based compared to what they're paying today wow. on these expensive fuels. Thinking back to maybe before you 
got dandelion off the ground because I realized that it's possible maybe dandelion is a part of a breakout for geothermal, and we'll talk about that. But maybe before dandelion, how would you describe or why why wasn't there a big breakout, and why weren't more people looking at geothermal? You know, for the last thirty years, or it's probably been around longer than yeah. that. Maybe can you give us the the kind of history of it um, in, in the U.S. in terms of when it kind of first got discovered, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Geothermal has been around for decades, at least since the 70s. I think the first systems went in before, maybe as early as the 40s or 50s in the U.S., but certainly the 70s is, I think, when you see more activity start. Um, And there are different types of geothermal. So some types of systems use they're called open loop and you just like take water in maybe from an aquifer, take the heat out of it and then put it back into the environment. Um, What dandelion does is called closed loop. So we have the water that we use to exchange heat with the ground running through closed pipes. So it's not coming into contact with the outside environment. I would say that type of geothermal system probably was pioneered in the seventies. I think it's always been a fairly niche technology in this country. Um, There's a lot of geothermal installations in Sweden. So there's like a proof point that it can work at a wide scale at a, in a very cold climate country. Um, But we never really saw them take off in this country. And I think I have, I have quite a few hypotheses for why that is. I don't, I can't claim to say I know, but I would say, um, a few things that held it back were one fossil fuels have been fairly inexpensive for a long time in this country. And so if you can get oil very cheaply, there's obviously less of an incentive to switch away from it. I think also the types of contractors that install HVAC systems in homes, it tends to be a patchwork of many thousands of small companies in every local place. And I think because of that, there was no natural like larger company with access to resources that could do R and D, for example, Mm -hmm. that was naturally well positioned to take on the challenge. That's a really interesting point. And even when I think about like the supply chain of HVAC stuff, where in the West, you know, it's a long ways, between cities and all that stuff gets to a warehouse and yeah yeah once it gets to that warehouse everybody understands this one system this patchwork of small contractors Mm -hmm. and so even if one of those systems did land on the shelf the likelihood of some somebody oh yeah i'll take one of those is just slim by the time it's shipped clear out here and the you know the i guess the supply chain itself maybe can be a constraint in terms of adoption It absolutely is. And that was something I really thought about when I was thinking about starting the company because one approach we could have been tempted to take is really focus on creating, only creating a new geothermal heat pump, like the actual Mm -hmm. heat pump itself. Yes. But like, let's imagine that we created the best possible geothermal heat pump. Then what? right? Like Mm -hmm. then you somehow have to get all these distributors to want to buy it. And then you have to get contractors to buy it from them. And there's not really a good, and and then why would they do that if customers didn't even know about it? It's like the go-to-market would be extremely difficult. So a lot of starting the company had to involve the go-to-market as well. Like we had to really think holistically about how do we just like uh, make homeowners aware of a different paradigm for heating and cooling, like a different type of system, a different way to think about buying this type of equipment in addition to making the heat pump itself. That's a good point. Cause if you did make the world's best heat pump and then the, the client asks their contractor, Hey, I'm thinking about buying this. I saw a cool commercial at the Super Bowl. What do you think? That person could just be like, they could kill it for you in its infancy. Easily. Because they they haven't seen it. And so that's a really, it may have seemed easier to do that, but. Yeah, yeah. they probably would kill it because if you're that contractor and you haven't been trained to install it, you've never done it before. Like 
why would you take on that risk? Yeah. You know, and like even today, I think in the market, you're starting to see some new, like nicely designed window AC units. Yes. There's some companies out there starting to innovate in that space. And I think that's because that's like the one piece of HVAC equipment that consumers buy directly and then they yes. install themselves. So you can actually innovate with that product more easily than you can with yep. a just bypass the contractor kind of. Yeah. Oh, wow. And just, it's an easier, it's an easier go to market. So when you kind of put this together, I'm guessing you were sort of almost reluctant, like this is probably going to be more work to do the installs and hire technicians and buy heavy equipment. But unfortunately it's probably our best bet. Is that kind of what led you to, and maybe in, as part of this, describe how Dandelion operates in terms of um, installing and in general. Yeah. I wish we had had that level of wisdom and foresight at the <laughs> beginning. <laughs> unfortunately it's hard won wisdom because when I co-founded the company in 2017, we, uh, our hypothesis was we will make this nice heat pump. We'll make some software for contractors to use to help them sell it. Mm -hmm. We'll train some contractors to sell it. And then we'll sell it through contractors and they'll install it and sell it. Um, and it just didn't work. It like, mm -hmm. it would have been easier to not have yeah. to, be vertically integrated and lease the warehouses and get the equipment and buy the drills. Right. So of course we yeah. didn't want to do those things, Yeah. but soon we were confronted with reality that we had to in order for yeah. the company to survive. And so I remember very clearly that decision dawning on me and just realizing if I, if you know, there was only one way forward. And so oh. As much as we didn't want to take all of that on, we kind of had yeah. to. And so we did. And I think in some in some ways, it's easier when you don't have a choice. You're like, well, yeah. it's kind of, it has to be this way. So, yeah. okay, here we go. Yeah. But I am yeah. thankful we came around to that realization as quickly as we did. Because I do believe the company would have failed if we hadn't made that change. But mm -hmm. just to your question about what's the company's business model now. We are pretty much vertically integrated, though we do use subcontractors in some regions sometimes. So we aren't a purely vertically integrated model, but we do have um, Dandelion installers, our employees of the company. They receive benefits. They receive equity in the company. Similarly, we have drillers that are employees that receive benefits and equity of the company. We have our own sales and marketing team. Um, and we have an engineering team that works on our heat pump product. So we really are tackling this problem across like every aspect of it, which I think is necessary for something like geo where the pieces existed in the market before, but no one had really brought them together into a cost effective, great customer experience. Um, but over time, I do think as the market matures and we're able to succeed in sort of improving our, our customer, like just improving the options available to customers, better financing options, more types of heat pumps. I think as that happens, we'll have more opportunities to, to do more subcontracting. And you kind of see it in solar maybe, like at the beginning, vertical integration was more important because there was no infrastructure in the industry but today there are so many companies that, yeah. you know, provide software, provide financing, provide mounting equipment, like whatever it is, there's a company yeah. for it in solar. And so you're able to see um, more of the companies have subcontractor models work. I think yeah. we'll see something similar in GM. Yeah. And, you know, there may come a time and probably nothing would make you happier if some contractor open for business and, and what do they do? They install dandelion heat pumps and they are fully trained and they, yes. that would take an enormous, uh, level of just, I don't, not just the work and stress, but just, and more efficiency. They'd probably be more productive because yeah. they could manage their employees tighter. So maybe they'll exactly. come a day when, when there's like, for example, there's a, um, I'm thinking of septic tanks cause we just did one at my place and our viewers will probably see that video soon, but 
there's a manufacturer kind of local that ships nationwide. And I know one of their systems was very new and at, 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 but at the moment, everybody knows how to use it and puts it in and they can kind of focus on what they do very best, you know, innovating and making the product and such. Exactly. But maybe I, it'll get that you're way. exactly right. That would be the ideal. And I do think that there's a reason that contractors do tend to be smaller companies that are locally focused because there's enough um, advantage to being able to specialize in your own community yep. that it's made sense for for the business to evolve in that direction. So it is somewhere where we aspire to get to eventually, though. I think um, having the vertical integration now has been hugely important just because now we're, we have full control over the customer experience. Yep. We can make sure every job is done in a high quality way. Yeah. And we just have learned a lot, right? Because we're, we're the ones getting those insights directly. Yeah, for sure. If, if you're ever training contractors how to do it, you're going to know a lot about, mm -hmm. the, you, you've learned a lot of the nitty gritty that maybe yeah. would have been tough to learn without staffing up a bunch of, you know, drillers and such. Um, can you talk about drilling for a second? Because maybe I haven't done a good job um, leading this, but for the listener, your system, from what I understand, goes down vertically drilled like a well as opposed to some geo systems are more horizontal and loop through the yard and i watched the the video from this old house and the machine was just so cool it's, i'll say tiny but i know it's not tiny but Small when you think of a well drilling machine it's like a semi truck yeah. and so can you talk about that equipment and technology and how the system works in that way and maybe finish we've been talking about closed loops and heat pumps but maybe sort of button that up and explain to anybody who hasn't figured it out how the home gets heated and cooled kind of while you're at it. Of course. Maybe I'll start there and then go into yeah. a discussion of the ground loop. So Correct. okay. Yeah. So the way that a geothermal heating and cooling system works is um, at its core, you have a heat pump and a heat pump is a system that can use electricity to move heat from one place to another. So an example of a heat pump you're probably familiar with is a refrigerator, which uses electricity to move heat from the inside to the outside of the refrigerator, thereby cooling it. So a geothermal heat pump can move in both directions. It can move heat into your house to warm it, and it can move heat out of your house to cool it. And the special thing about a geothermal heat pump is where it's getting that heat from or where it's pushing it back to in the case of cooling. And so for a geo, that is the ground. So we have a thermal connection to the ground, which is, it's a heat exchanger, which sounds fancy, but it's really just some plastic pipes buried in the yard with water yeah. running through them. But um, those pipes allow the heat pump to absorb heat from the ground. And then the heat pump extracts that heat and concentrates it or like boosts the temperature. So even though the ground is only, let's say, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you can heat your house to a normal temperature, let's say 72 or whatever you like to keep it at. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the summer, the whole system reverses. So instead of your air conditioner, which is also a type of heat pump that rejects heat into the outside air, your geothermal heat pump will work similarly, but reject that heat into the ground. Wow. Now, why go through the trouble of exchanging heat with the ground? The reason to do it is heat really doesn't love to go from cold places to hot places. It likes to go from hot places to cold places just because of thermal dynamics. So if you can minimize that gradient against what you're pushing heat against its natural course, then you're essentially minimizing the amount of energy you need to run the system. Hmm. And that results in a very low electricity bill to the customer for running the system. So hmm. Um, when you run a geothermal heat pump, you're basically running at 400% efficiency, which sounds impossible. But the reason that it is possible is because for every unit of electricity, let's say you, you use to make the system run, you're actually harvesting four units of renewable heating energy from the ground and moving it into the house. So mm. instead of just like burning a fuel where <laughs> that is the source of heat, you're using energy to actually move energy from one place to another. Wow. 
Wow. It's just, it, like you said, it sounds too good to be true, kind of like, in mm-hmm. other words, our homes are built on the earth and the earth has this, I would call it like a temperature, but you're referring to it as energy. There's the, mm-hmm. the temperature is the energy yes. and we're sitting on top of it. Think of it as temperature, 50 degrees. That If that's warmer than the 20 degrees outside, then that's energy that can be pulled into the house. That's so, right. And now, now maybe talk about the drilling right. and the loops and all that. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just, I think what you said is a really good way of thinking about it. And in the same way you can drill a water well, if you live on top of an aquifer and then you just pump that water into your house, we're doing the same thing. It's like every house is on this huge reservoir of energy. It's just like heat energy. God, so is that like, well. like in Arizona? I lived in Phoenix. Is that 50 degrees under the ground in Phoenix? Is that just planet Earth spec is 50 degrees or whatever? It's it's not exactly. So the, the temperature in the shallow subsurface will be the average of the air temperature year round. Okay. So if you average, um, yeah, the annual air temperature in a given area, you'll get the ground temperature. So 50 is... I say it because I'm based, you know, Dandelion's based in New York. I would guess maybe uh, in Phoenix, it might be a bit higher. Yeah. But Phoenix has cold winters or they get cold. So the average is is not going to be like 110. (laughs) No. No. And so in the winter, the fact that the ground temperature is a bit higher in Phoenix would help you because you'd be drawing heat from a higher you know, yeah. more heat content there. Um, and here's a geology question, but I'm just thinking out loud. And for the, this heat is coming from the center of the earth, not from like the sun. Although you, you said the average temperature, which makes yeah. me feel like maybe it is the sun. Which is it? It's the sun. You're exactly right. So huh. we're so shallow. And when I say shallow, we drill on average about 350 feet deep. So oh. shallow to the earth, not shallow yeah, to relatively. humans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, relatively shallow. But yeah, it's still at a, um, it's still shallow enough that what we're truly harvesting is stored sunlight. It's not. No kidding. It's wow. not. So the, the, the origin of the energy is also solar. It's the it sun's is. energy that's been stored in the. How that's deep do you have to go? And maybe you don't know this, but till you're finding like the core of the earth kind of warmth coming out, because isn't the center of the earth really hot and it gets warmer as you go deeper? Yeah. The center of the earth is really hot. And if you are doing geothermal, like Iceland geothermal for electricity, you have to go very deep because you do want to hit those like very hot, much higher than 50 degrees Fahrenheit pockets uh, to boil water and generate steam and run a turbine. But for us, yeah, we don't really need to worry about the center of the earth or magma or any of those things because we're just using essentially captured solar energy. That's amazing. So when you're drilling down 350 feet, are you concerned? Does it matter if you hit an aquifer? You just go right through it and same difference. It's still the temperature or, or what type of thinking are you doing yeah. before you like drill in the ground besides just like hitting somebody's internet or something? <laughs> well, we definitely do worry about buried utilities and map mm-hmm. those out beforehand, but it's actually good news if we hit an aquifer. Um, so one of the advantages of having the closed loop system that Dandelion standard standardizes around is it's totally, um, our loops are completely sealed from the environment. So there's, the closed loop system is maximally environmentally friendly. There's not a lot of risk of contamination. Hmm. And the if we go through an aquifer, we go through water, Water is very conductive. It's very good at conducting heat. So that aquifer will be extremely efficient at giving heat to that ground loop. Um, So it's actually, it's actually a good thing. It it means that your system will, will perform very well if there's high water content in the ground. It's okay if there's not, like we would, we would just have to install more loop. uh, There was a very dry area. So these drillers, these, these, uh, tradesmen or people you have drilling are they coming from like well drilling backgrounds is geo is drilling geothermal is it all this is drilling all the same you know whether it's well or it's, oil or geo i know i know yeah. zero about it but yeah it's not really it's not really the same we do have some well drillers yes that install our loops it's uh you can use a water well rig to do it 
if okay. it fits in the yard, which sometimes it doesn't, but if it does fit, you can use it. We also use um, people from mining can be good at installing ground loops or geotechnical uh, drillers can be good. Mm -hmm. People who um, drill in very traditional oil and gas, uh, I don't know, what's the right word? Like oil and gas fields or oil and yeah, gas. Exploration and stuff. Exploration yeah. operations. Mm -hmm. I think that they could be great at doing loops, but it's not quite as common of a yeah. transition because with oil and gas, you have huge equipment and just like extremely specialized labor. Yes. Um, and a lot of people sort of working on a site at a given time. Whereas what we do, it's like tiny equipment with like two or three people doing everything. It's just like a pretty different scale and yes. type of situation. So Which we don't actually is one yeah. of the features because you are installing in older retrofit also. I'm sure new construction, but is, is it retrofit. the case that yeah. you're you're going into some home with a, a gas system and and retrofitting? In other words, pulling yeah. into their neighborhood and and drilling. Yeah. Yep. And so we're installing that loop and then they can use geo for heating and cooling and they don't need to use whatever they were using before. Yeah. But to your original question that I've kept <laughs> kind of not answering. Nice. Um, yeah. So one of the, one of the issues with getting geo to more people is the, the rigs that had been used to do this in the past were well, some people did horizontal, which you described, where you actually excavate a large area in the yard to put pipe in. Yes. And that's yeah. actually fine. Like, it can be a good option. It's just, if you live in a suburban environment, you probably don't have enough space. Like, right. horizontal is a good option if you don't care about ripping up a large patch of your yeah. yard and you just have a lot of land. Yeah. But that, how deep, are those like six feet deep or eight feet deep? Are they like an excavator can kind of yeah, coke and you can dig use that an out. excavator. Okay. Um, but I mean, I would envision like installing an in-ground swimming pool. It's there you just, go. Um, a pretty, but bigger, you know. So yeah. it's just like a pretty big uh, hole, which again I think can be a good option for a lot of homeowners who have mm -hmm. the land and don't mind. Um, don't mind like having that area disrupted, but we, I just, I guess we could see that if that's the, the only option, like clearly geo will never become a mainstream approach because right. everyone in Westchester cannot do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so then the second, so for people who needed the vertical, well, that has existed before as well, but the, the rigs that have been used to put in those vertical wells have been water well rigs. Uh-huh. And for our customers today at Dandelion, about 50% of them have yards large enough to accommodate a rig like that. So about half of our customers could physically have that done and half we would just, we wouldn't be able to serve if we only had the water well rig because their yards are too small. Yeah. When you say rig for the listener, that's, it's like heavy equipment. It's like this yeah. big machine, like a semi truck, right? That it is. Yeah. Sets that's up. Right. Kind of think of it like a garbage truck size okay. um, driving onto your yard. And it has a tall mast that um, holds the the drill and then, yeah, and then drills down. So again, that can be actually a really good solution for homes that have the space and are big enough to accommodate, but a lot of homes aren't. And I guess one of the, one of the things that we saw and we continue to believe is that in order for geo to really take off and become mainstream, you can't have solutions that only serve such a tiny fraction of homes, right? We needed to like have the ability to serve not just the rural homes, the big yards, but also the homes in the town or in the suburb. Because until enough people with different situations can get it, it would just yeah, it would just be too difficult to have to cherry pick so much, like mm -hmm. who the people who could qualify for this were. So we invested in a much smaller um, suite of drilling equipment that you saw in this old house. 
And that rig is a sonic rig. So it vibrates and sort of causes the ground to liquefy. Um, wow. It's very easy to sl- for that. It, that drill, it's amazing. It kind of looks like it's slipping into the ground. Like the ground isn't even a solid. It's really cool to watch it. Can you feel it when you're standing next to the machine? Does the ground vibrating? Not really. No, the ground is really good at attenuating the vibration. Yeah. You can't really, That's crazy. you can't really feel it, but, um, wow. but yeah, so that rig has allowed us to access and serve a lot of customers that just would not have even been possible before. Was, is that rig like built and developed and designed for geo kind of use? Or was that something from like well or mining for super specialized uses that could kind of also work for geo? In other words, like, wh- where does that rig come from and who, who developed that neat little thing? Yeah. So it's the latter. It's um, there are a few companies that develop sonic rigs. We work with TerraSonic is the name of the company that developed that rig for oh. us. It's built, I think it's often used in geotechnical applications. Oh, that makes We've sense. We've modified it to be um, to be used in our geo application. And it's been it's been really helpful just like opening up the market and um, and allowing more customers to convert. We've also added a lot of pieces in addition to the rig. So We've worked on, uh, we have a piece now that is used to basically like keep the site clean because yeah. a lot of homeowners don't appreciate it when mud goes yeah. everywhere. So like yeah. we keep our drilling site clean. Um, we've just invested in having the right suite of equipment so that it's easy to transport. Yeah. We can arrange it in a sort of a Tetrisy way to fit the yard that we're in. And it doesn't right. require too big of a crew to operate because if you have fewer people, of course, that's lower cost for the homeowner. Yeah. So maybe let's kind of finish on that aspect because there's a lot of cool things that you can get if you're willing to spend the money on them and maybe talk a little bit about the cost of these systems and the payback and the savings. And you guys are, are doing a lot of installs, so they're, the cost must make sense um, on some scale. So how does that work? Yeah. So the customer... Um, has two options when they're buying a system. And we we really took our inspiration from Solar, who came up with this model. But um, half of our customers pay for the system with a loan. So they pay nothing up front, and then they pay a monthly payment. Hmm. And then half pay with cash. So they have an upfront payment, and then they have a payback period. Um, so starting with the loan, let's say, um, Customers pay no money down in around 150 or so dollars a month for geo, and that just includes everything. So the design, the ground loop install, the heat pump install, the heat pump itself, you know. Mm-hmm. And for our target customer, which is somebody switching from fuel oil or propane, they pay on average more than $150 a month for fuel oil or propane. So they come yeah. out ahead, right, right yeah. away. Yeah. And it's a popular option because – For a lot of people, I mean, you need to replace your furnace at some point anyway, right? It's going to break someday. So if you can actually replace it with a geo system that does heating and cooling and not pay anything and pay less than you're already paying per month, that's a really nice deal. Yeah, that's a a really nice deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the other hand, we have some homeowners that prefer just to own things and they have the resources to do so. So for those homeowners... It usually comes out to between twenty to twenty five thousand dollars after incentives from the utility, and um, for those homeowners, I mean, typically a homeowner using fuel oil or propane in the Northeast is probably spending between three and four thousand dollars a year on fuel oil or propane. Yeah, with geo, they're probably going to be spending around a thousand dollars a year on electricity to run the heat pump. Yeah, so you're looking at a savings of about two to three thousand dollars a year. So for a twenty to twenty five thousand um, dollar upfront payment, if you are not planning to replace your furnace at all ever, you would be looking at a ten year payback around. But a lot of people, of course, are planning to replace their furnace and air conditioner right. at some point, so that yeah, shortens it. That so we usually see a payback of around five to ten years. And you know the funny thing, and I don't know to what extent you guys use this in your let's say sales or marketing material, but 
these these are n- numbers are relevant at the cost of fuel today and if right. the cost of fuel rises which it probably will maybe dramatically um the cost of the geothermal energy is not going to rise in other That's words right. that is money in the bank in <laughs> in those terms yeah. so you're kind of locking in your cost as opposed to remaining uh vulnerable to big market you know swings and fluctuations which i honestly don't know to what extent you know i don't live in the east northeast so around here i'm in southern oregon our climate's pretty mild and generally speaking our heating and cooling bills are minor but i know there's places where they really really uh amount to a a big portion of your you know household budget energy that's right yep and that is why we didn't start the company on you know, in Southern Oregon or in the Bay yeah. Area, right? Because you're yeah. right. It's like around, sorry, around here where I am right now in the Bay Area or in Southern Oregon, it really isn't. It's like easy to forget what a yeah. huge expense that is for so many millions of people <laughs> in this did, country. Did you guys go to New York kind of like, hey, this is, they got the right, there's a lot of people, heating's a deal. It was a very strategic, like we're yes. going right here for that mm-hmm. exact reason, I take it. Yep. It was the state where you had the combination of cold winters and warm summers. So a lot of heating or cooling is needed. There are just frankly a lot of people in that yeah. state and surrounding states. And there's a ton of fuel oil, millions of people using it. So for all those reasons, just um, the level of expenditure is yeah. incredibly high. Yeah. And then you know, on top of that, New York is very focused on meeting its greenhouse gas emissions goals. And one of their their second biggest source of emissions after transportation is heating in buildings. So mm. the yeah. state is actually very aware that they need to electrify heating yeah. and their goals are aligned with our goals. Right. And that yeah. was that was really helpful as well. Yeah, that is really neat. Um, okay, two more questions for you. Number one, and I'm just thinking out loud, are there ever developments, and this might be a little bit away from Dandelion, where entire, I'm just thinking about the technology, let's say, where entire subdivisions could all be on one big ground loop and like heating like a whole neighborhood? Does that ever happen in any parts of the world? Because that seems like that would be a really efficient way to spread out you know, the cost of all these things. Or is that is that just still science fiction? It's not science fiction. It does happen. Um, there are developments that exist today that are set up in that way. Hmm. My my perspective on that, though, is it's actually not. It's not more efficient and it's not more cost effective than just doing individual loops for every home. So Interesting. I think the time when you would want to do a district system, which is what we call what you described, oh, okay. is if you have, let's say, a hospital and a bunch of homes, and they're all sharing the same ground loop. Because the hospital is going to be very cooling dominated. Even in the winter, that yeah. hospital might need to be cooling. So it's going to be putting heat into the loop. And if those houses then can extract that heat in the winter, oh. that's beneficial and you don't need as big of a ground loop because you have yeah. some complement complementarity. But if you just have a residential neighborhood, everyone's going to be heating at the same time. Everyone's going to be cooling at the same time. So you can't really decrease the size of the ground loop. Yeah. But you're adding complexity because you need to connect every house and you can't position those ground loops in the perfect place that you would have for every house because you have to consider the whole system and yeah. I don't know. It's just like more complicated. Yeah, that makes sense. And th- there's a complicating factor to shared utilities also where when there's maintenance or something, yeah. then yeah. You know, the, maybe the original people who do the system, or it works great, but a generation goes by. Right. I, I have a shared community kind of river water agreement where I live and we're all really grateful for it, but it's complicated interacting with all these neighbors mm-hmm. on this private sort of utility that is shared yeah. with people who did not design and develop it. So there, you know, I guess with the fact that you guys have the ability to go individual retrofit, that certainly does sound appealing. Yeah. I think it's just, it's, there's a resiliency to, you know, have, if if one, if one person has some issue with their loop, it won't affect anyone else. But then also it's just, it's actually like not, I think it's less expensive to just have that rig 
put the loops in one house, go to the next house, go to the next house, yeah. go to the next house, and then don't worry about connecting them because why point. would you? Yeah. Even just like from an engineering standpoint, because you can calculate how many feet of loops do we need for this square foot of house, this many, yeah. and you can install exactly that many yeah. as opposed to like going across the yard and yeah. bend down or, or whatever. That's, wow, right. that's really neat. So can you give us the, and if there, I know we have listeners in the Northeast and you guys are only doing installs there at the moment, I believe. So right. maybe talk to us about how those folks can get in touch. And if there's other people listening, I don't know, maybe we've got a well driller listening who's would love <laughs> to be a part. Are you guys looking for a uh, tradesman? Are we business? ever? Yes. If you are a well dr driller listening, please get in touch. Um, we need you. Um, my, yeah, the best way to do that is hello at dandelionenergy.com, which I monitor. So I will see it personally. Um, okay. and for anyone else in the Northeast, especially right now, we're available in Connecticut, New York, and soon Massachusetts, but not yet, uh, and parts of Vermont. So we're, we're, you know, fairly limited in terms of our geographies today, but that's, changing pretty rapidly. Um, if you go to our website, dandelionenergy.com, th uh, there's a link there that says, um, you know, join or get a system. And you can, you can click that to sort of give us your information. And we'll give you a call. Um, and yeah, I think even if you're not in one of our territories, sometimes we look at the homeowners who have expressed interest as a way of figuring out where where it looks like demand is coming from and where we should prioritize expanding to next. Got it. So if there's a bunch of you listening from Michigan who email, that might move yeah. Michigan up the chain of uh, priority for your next Michigan office. Michigan is a great market for geo. It is yeah. actually one of the hot spots in the U.S. that has embraced geo in the past. So that would huh. be, yeah, that's there a good example. Go. Well, man, you're really a unique person with this this engineering civil background, which we barely touch, touched on. And I, I, I'm sure to some extent that engineering education is really valuable for you just in understanding utilities and access and how these things go together. But And then uh, the time at Google and tech, and now here you are basically a contractor. Now, yeah. that's a that's a broad term. Yes, but, I am. Like I said, you you just put out a call to hire a well driller, and I that's know. pretty. Uh, I, not very uh, many people do that. <laughs> I actually recently did pass my home improvement contractor licensing exam. Okay, you County, you so are a contractor. I am a contractor. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think engineering. I think it's been really helpful. I mean, I would say. I would say that quantitative framework, right, for analyzing problems and really figuring out how to make a question precise mm -hmm. and then how to answer it in a way that really makes your assumptions visible and lets somebody else follow your logic. All of those tools, I use them all the time. And, um, and of course, it also is just helpful to have some sense of geotechnical engineering and fluid dynamics and all these classes I took thinking, will I ever use this? And now I actually do sometimes use yeah. them. Boy, howdy. Are you, you're one of the few people who are really, really using them and actually maybe uh -huh. pushing the, the bounds of what, you know, at least how they're used with that little, uh, sauna vibrating. Exactly. Yeah. With the sonic. <laughs> bell. Yeah. Well, Kathy, thanks so much. So it's dandelionenergy.com, I believe. That's and we'll, right put links to these things in the description. And for our viewers, this old house did a show with you guys. They came and filmed and that's, I watched that and it was just great. It's classic, this old house, you know, production and quality. And it really showcases this little rig and nice graphics for how the system works. So um, go watch that if you're fuzzy in any way about if we le left anything out, but great, great uh, resource there. And Kathy, can't thank you enough for coming on. Keep up the great work. I love um, what you guys are doing. And and uh, someday maybe we'll get to take a closer look at the system. And uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you.